Okay, once again, a hearty welcome. And I'm very pleased to have such a huge crowd for an exciting conversation tonight. As announced, this is organized by the Institute of Social Sciences of the University of Stuttgart, the Serious Participation and Deliberation Lab at the University of Stuttgart. Can I please ask everyone to put off mics and, and, and cameras, because otherwise we'll have noises with so many people. Thank you so much. So it's a, we have organized it broadly, and I'm so pleased to see so many people, familiar faces, unfamiliar faces. And the whole event is linked with the launch of the new special issue of Deliberative Democracy on Christina Lafon's book, Deliberative Democracy, Democracy Without Shortcuts. You have a little kind of announcement in the chat. Please, everyone opens. And you can, the, the whole chat is open access, so you can download all articles. And I think it's really, really worth taking a look at that. Because it's not just a special issue on Christina's book, a sort of a review, but it's much more than that. It's really people and contributors have started thinking and rethinking participatory democracy in the 21st century, and including a wonderful piece by Jürgen Habermas. Now, today I welcome three contributors of the special issue and three superstars of democratic theory, Christina Lafont, Jenny Mansbach and Mark Warren. I'm so pleased that you have accepted the invitation to talk about participatory and democracy tonight. And organization-wise, I have a couple of things. I'm so sorry for being repetitive all the time. Everyone puts off the camera and mic. Otherwise, we'll have issues. There's another thing which is very, very important. We will record the whole thing. And from the perspective of European uh, data law protection, if you're not okay with being recorded, you unfortunately must leave the room now. If you stay in, we will record you. Third of all, if you have comments, please don't jump in, but use the chat. That's particularly important when we have the discussion after about 60 minutes of um, conversation among the three, Christina, Jenny, and Mark. And then you can use something like a kind of little hash key to put yourself in the chat, and then I will call you. And I think, I hope that all works. So now let's get it started, finally. And um, I want to start with a kind of an intro question. When we look a bit and think back on of the riots on Capitol Hill and the inauguration of Joe Biden yesterday, I think we, it's really a big question. How do we in some way think democracy in the 21st century, particularly when we also think about a participatory orientation of democracy? And I would like to ask the three of you, starting with Christina, how should it look like such a democracy in the 21st century? How should it look like? How can it look like? Christina, I think, get it started. And then comes Jenny, then comes Mark, and then we'll have a discussion among the three of you. Please get it started. Sure. Thank you so much, Andre, for organizing this. This is, is this amazing. And after all what we have seen last week and yesterday, it's a perfect moment to think about the future of democracy. I feel a little bit more optimistic than last week. And so in my view, I think that when we think about how to make a participatory democracy more vibrant and better, we need to get right what is the reason for the crisis of democracy that we have been witnessing, and we are unfortunately still going to be witness for a while. And so in my view, um, there are many reasons for the crisis, and there are complex ones, but the most important reason we need to address, we need to understand, is that citizens, no matter what political persuasion, have the impression of that they are losing the power to influence decisions. Uh, and in my opinion, what I defend in the book or explain in the book is that we can think of it in terms of the construction of too many anti-democratic shortcuts that allow too many powerful actors to influence political decisions directly or to even make those decisions without in any way having to take into account the process of opinion will formation in which the citizenry participates as a whole. And because of this, citizens feel even if they live in democracies, even if they haven't in any way lost the 
formal rights that they used to have, even though they can vote and they have freedom of assembly, etc., they have the impression that those formal rights no longer really come with the power to influence political decisions, to make those decisions be responsive to their interests, their needs, and uh, their opinions. And in that way, I think the crisis of democracy, among many other reasons that it has around it, is a crisis of, due to political alienation. Citizens cannot identify with the political decisions. And I think that captures it as a matter for citizens in the right, in the left. The problem of political alienation, I think, is what is producing the crisis and the backlash of populism, the attempt to say, hey, let's try now to make the system more responsive, etc. So if that is what we think is happening and that is what needs to be addressed, I think that in thinking of possible new venues of institutionalization, of citizen participation, for example, new ways of rethinking the political system, we need to have as the goal the possibility to increase the democratic control of the citizenry as a whole. And what I try to convey in the book, which is a kind of meta commentary about the direction we should be going, right? For those who not only are thinking about democracy, but those who really actually can influence the design of new institutions, of participatory institutions, for example. I think that it's important that they keep the overall goal in mind that we need to design new institutions, we need to increase participation of ordinary citizens with the aim not just of empowering those few who may participate in those new institutions, say many publics, etc., not with the aim that they get to have more influence in those decisions or even to make those decisions themselves, but with the aim of helping us, the rest of the citizenry, which is never as a whole going to participate directly in politics, to have more control of what the decisions are. And whether they are responsive to their own views, right? So in my view, there are two possibilities to think of new institutions as having the aim that those few that participate are participating. I think that's great, but I don't think that this will be per se an increase of democratic control for the citizenry. I think that will just simply be a nice feature to have that ordinary citizens can to be involved, but that is not really going to help democracy to be more vibrant, right? It's just only going to have kind of create new shortcuts with new types of actors, no matter whether they are ordinary citizens or not. And so the way of thinking about it is that what we want is not to have even more shortcuts just with new actors, but to help those institutions of participation to empower the rest of the citizenry. And I think that if we agree with the goal, like if, if the goal, the democratic goal is actually make in the long term the political system or the political decision making more responsive to a inclusive and properly informed considered public opinion, then we have like a kind of three levels at which we can work and will work and for which new institutions can be helpful. One has to do with increasing representation of the political system to make the political system more responsive in the sense of actually having a uh, capacity to connect, to empathically know what the interests, values, and objectives of their constituents are. Of course, the political system has been kind of out of touch and it does not seem to be sufficiently representative. Um, if we take the example of, of the US, for example, there is that sense that the two big parties really cater to the 1%, right? That the Republican Party cater only to the 1% of the wealthy and the Democratic Party to the intellectual elite. And the other 99% are not represented. And that in a way explains a lot of how Trump came to power as kind of breaking with that, right? So then we need absolutely to make the political system more responsive, in that sense, more representative of the whole of the citizenry. For that, we could have new ways of institutional -like participation of citizens. We also need to have an inclusive, properly inclusive and consider uh, a formation of public opinion. And of course, that's like a, a nightmare. We need to change the, we need to regulate the social media. We have to change the uh, business model that increases for profit, polarization, fake news, uh, hatred. Like we know that this is the business model. So we do need to regulate that and create an alternative. And then also we need to make, uh, 
to increase the ability of citizens to know what problems matters, what are the options, political options, and they cannot do that on their own, right? So even if we had a better media uh, environment, we could use uh, participatory in institutions to offer kind of informational shortcuts to help the citizenry to detect what the problems are, what the solutions are, could be, and to make the debate among political disagreements more centered in what really reflects the views, the interests, and the values of the citizenry, and not on the noise created by trolls, by you know uh, manipulation, etc. So in all these three levels, we could do a lot, but the, what I think will be important is that the tracking which we are doing it, the aim is really to increase the responsiveness of, this, of the political system to the views of the citizenry as a whole, rather than to just create another type of shortcut. So for now, I think that maybe, you know. Super. On to you, Jenny. Well, I'm awfully glad we're all here to talk about this question, because we do need a vibrant and robust participatory democracy in the 21st century. And many people recognize this now, the European Consortium for Political Research as a relatively new group called Democratic Innovation, dedicated in part to understanding how to create such participatory democracy and following their lead. The American Political Science Association has just created Democratic Innovations Group. So I haven't seen as much interest in participatory democracy in Europe and the United States since the late 1960s. But there's a big difference between then and now. Then we were driven by hope, and now we're driven by fear. And our fear has a rational basis. We see the anger of some of those left behind fed in part by racism and xenophobia, crystallizing both in Europe and the United States into an authoritarian brand of populism that threatens democracy. And only two weeks ago, of course, we saw one result as an infuriated mob attack the US Capitol. So we today on this panel, along with many of you here, are trying to cure this ill of democracy by more democracy. We are asking for fear. Hope expands the horizon, but fear sharpens the intellect. Now, Jane Adams coined that phrase, the cure for the ills of democracy is more democracy. John Dewey went further, saying that it did not mean more machinery of the same kind of democracy, but instead clarifying and deepening our understanding of democracy. And her new, in her new book, Christina LaFont provides that clarifying and that deepening. So in our fear, as we search for answers, we can turn to that clarity and depth. So LaFont's key goal is that citizens should, quote, own and identify with the institutions, laws, and policy that coerce them. That owning, that identification are particularly important today when many feel, often correctly, as Christina said, they have not been heard in producing the laws that coerce them. So the entire book flows from that focus on ownership and identification, clarified and deepened. Now, how can citizens own and identify with the institutions, laws, and policy that coerce them? Christina makes many good suggestions. My own suggestions include radical decentralization on the most sensitive issues whenever possible, new forms of facilitated negotiation at the local level, more use of random selection for citizen deliberation, on which I think everyone on this panel agrees, and better mechanisms of what I call recursive communication between citizens and their representatives meaning iterated, mutually responsive communication. So we'll have time to discuss all that here. I want to leave you with one thought. Today's democratic institutions cannot produce sufficient legitimacy to sustain all the state coercion that we now need. Our increasing human interdependence has produced increasing numbers of collective action problems 
that for their solution require more collective solidarity, more collective commitment to duty, and unfortunately also more state coercion increasing amounts of state coercion as we become increasingly more interdependent. The right-wing rebellions against the state are fueled in part by a reaction against this necessarily increasing state coercion. We're right to fear those rebellions. We are right to fear the predictable resistance to the regulations that will slow climate change. If we can't figure out how to give those regulations more legitimacy, we are right to fear the worst. So today, participatory democracy is not a luxury, it's a necessity. We must have a more participatory democracy to produce the increasingly greater legitimacy that we will need. So thanks, Andre. Mark. Oh, uh, thank you, Andre. Thank you, uh, Christina. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks for these uh, inspirational uh, opening comments. Um, so uh, my thoughts are kind of thoughts from 30,000 feet that focused a little more on the, the, the hope side uh, than the fear <laughs> side, uh, notwithstanding the last um, week or so. Uh, I mean, the obvious is that uh, our democratic ideals are uh, under assault by uh, people who feel their, their power and status slipping. And even when they're not under assault, uh, as uh, Jenny just noted, uh, they're eroded by disappointment, and disaffection with uh, the kind of legacy institutions of, of representative democracy. Uh, so we're in a situation where we can't do nothing. Uh, I'm still very much an optimist. Uh, I think most historical trends are on the side of democracy, but history really needs our help at this point. Uh, <clears throat> and I think we need to organize that help around uh, aspirational ideals of democracy and not grudging ideals, right? It's not, not ideals like those of Churchill who famously said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. Uh, we need ideals that inspire. And this is uh, something that Christina's book uh, offers, offers in spades. Uh, democracy, uh, according to Christina, according to a lot of us, uh, is self-government in a deep way. Uh, again, Jenny underscored this, and I want to underscore it one more time. Uh, People need to own the laws and the policies of the government, and ownership is created through participation. Uh, participation in, in not just creating laws, but revising, challenging, uh, nudging, uh, and so on, uh, so that that sense of ownership uh, continually uh, increase. Um, <clears throat> particip participation needs to be uh, um, uh, supplemented with um, sufficient deliberation so that people know and understand how their own norms and interests are reflected in collective self-government. And we want self-government for highly aspirational um, purposes. Uh, self-government expresses human potentialities and capacities. Uh, self-government reflects and expresses the moral equality of persons so that each can live the best life possible. Uh, if we can remember this, we can begin to uh, uh, organize, to fight back, to uh, 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 introduce more self-rule into our collectivities, uh, organize collectivities that can match uh, uh, emerging and existing collective challenges that exceed our, uh, our existing um, um, juridically um, organized uh, collectivities like climate change. Um, democracy remains the most important political project of the last couple of centuries. Uh, so we, there's no reason for, uh, for uh, discouragement or apathy, or there may be, but we need to push back on that. Uh, the democratic project that follows from democratic ideals uh, is challenging, it's ambitious. Uh, one of the ways that I've kind of put this again at the very uh, um, high level is this, that political systems, if they're going to be democratic, need to do three sorts of things. They need to empower inclusions for individuals, uh, inclusions uh, in relationships that define their life chances. 
Um, second, they need to, to support and organize deliberation amongst people in order to form the interests, perspectives, and experiences they have in the collective wills and agendas. And third, uh, this, this is something that Jenny has uh, emphasized and emphasized again today, uh, we need collectivities with the power and capacity and legitimacy to provide for collective goods. If democracy can't do that, it fails. Uh, but achieving these ideals is, is really complicated. Um, not just because they fly in the face of unequal power, uh, uh, distributions of resources, resources and privileges, um, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, the opportunities for participatory um, governance, for participatory democracy, uh, continue to grow and pluralize in part for structural reasons, which I won't go into, uh, and we are also in an era when there is much more imagination being put to participatory governance and deliberative governance. Uh, there's a whole new world of democratic innovations uh, out there. Uh, these innovations um, are still an uphill fight. Uh, some of the fights are those of kind of power and exclusion, but some of them have to do with um, uh, limitations that are very generic, limitations of scale, complexity and scarcity of participatory resources for citizens. That is uh, scarcities of, of time, attention, priorities, uh, and the like. Uh, and <clears throat> so we need to fit participatory ideals into these realities. Uh, partly to do this, uh, they need to be combined with uh, many kinds of representative relationships. And here, not just elected uh, representatives, but representation through advocacy, NGOs, networks, uh, and the like. Uh, we need to think about lots of trusty relationships um, where uh, we, we trust uh, other people, other advocacy groups, other citizen bodies, uh, bureaucracies, public trustees, to do things that we don't have the time and attention for. Uh, democratic societies, will always be societies with high levels of trust and trust helps us to uh, get participatory um, energies and ideals to scale so uh, this is part of the background uh, that we need to be considering when we think about uh, the contributions of, of democratic innovations like uh, deliberative mini publics uh, one of the um, key topics in, in christina's book uh, Deliberative many publics uh, can't do everything. Uh, as Christina notes, they're, they're actually not very good participatory devices, uh, but they can do other things quite well. Uh, they can provide uh, new and democratic kinds of representation. Uh, they can uh, benefit from high levels of trust. Uh, they put some citizens in the position of, of representing other citizens. They provide new sites of deliberation that carry democratic credentials while, ben while benefiting from the perspectives and the values of ordinary citizens. Uh, they can help to inspire. They can build out democratic institutions in uh, new ways. But we do need to be clear that when we're advocating for something like a democratic innovation, like deliberative mini publics, uh, they can't bear the weight of the whole project. Uh, we need uh, a full range of uh, innovations uh, that plug into different problems uh, within uh, political systems and within uh, democratic systems. Uh, democratic theorists uh, can help, um, <clears throat> uh, not just as citizens, but by imagining uh, democratic innovations, helping set expectations for uh, what they can do, which pieces of the systems they can plug into, where they can push forward uh, little bits of the democratic uh, project, and hopefully we can move into a world where we have an ecology of institutions and practices that will uh, together uh, push the democratic project forward. Thanks. Super. Reactions, Jenny, Christina, Mark, to each other. Who wants to start to the opening speeches? Well, I'll just say that um, when I want emphasized the fear, I did not want at the same time to de-emphasize optimism. In other words, I was talking about what propels us, and just noticing that I lived, I, I lived through the 60s. I was very engaged in participatory democracy in the 60s, and it was a different 
it was a different time. Um, uh, now, I think we understand that this is almost deadly serious. Yeah. We've got to come up with some good suggestions, solutions. Um, so, but that doesn't mean to say that I, I'm not optimistic that we can. So that, <laughs> I just want to, to, to distinguish that. I think we can, and I think this panel is, a, not just this panel, but the, what this panel represents, Christina's book, and the, the whole, the, the innovations groups in, in Europe and, in, and America, it's representing a whole new generation of people who are thinking harder than I've seen people think about this problem in uh, many, many years. So I am optimistic. Christina, what about you? <laughs> I want to say something about that too, because I think as always, uh, when there are real crises, like no crisis should be left to waste. So what what can help us is precisely that there is a lot of energy coming from the citizenry really seeing the problems they are under, right? It's not because some ideals are not being fulfilled, it's because they have problems that are not being solved, that we see a lot of increase in interest in citizens' assemblies. We saw what happened in Ireland. I mean, it was extraordinary to see that the politicians really did not know where the population was on those issues, and they were astonished that to find out, right? So we can kind of use the energy that comes from the crisis, at least from those who really do not want to lose democracy, which I think is the majority of citizens who live in democracies, thankfully, to actually create those innovations, because it would not help if we had to do it like top down, and there was no real sense of why it will improve their lives if they actually get to participate, right? So in that way, I think there is a reason for optimism too. Uh, even with regard to those innovations, people are really realizing we need to do something. We need to um, influence the system. And if there are ways of participating, those will be taken on by people, I think. Yes, and I think uh, that, well, sorry, sorry. To, uh, you go ahead, Bob. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I just um, wonder if we can um, kind of clarify the, uh, uh, nature of the fears that we should have with respect to uh, old, older generations, new generations, and I guess uh, backlash demographics. So my sense is that uh, democratic ideals and aspirations continue to grow in most populations. And I think most, uh, it depends on the country, but most kind of cross-national surveys kind of bear this out generation by generation. So, a hopeful account of the disaster in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, is that this is uh, the backlash of um, uh, a declining uh, demographic. Now, I think this is not, Jenny thinks that this is not the, the best way to put this. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there's one, uh, uh, I think fairly persuasive book by uh, uh, Pippa Norris, uh, who uh, puts in Ron Engelhardt that, that put the backlash theory. Now, uh, this is hopeful in some way, uh, in that I do think that the demographics are on the, on the side of, of uh, more robust democracy, uh, but the backlash can do an incredible amount of damage uh, and perhaps uh, set the cause back um, uh, decades. I think there's a mistake that uh, Pippa and Ron make, Pippa Bernaris and Ron Engelhardt make in um, sort of uh, more describing what's going on as kind of quintessentially the work of a sort of small group. Um, I, th I think that the tip of, tip, tip of the iceberg, it's obviously a group of, of, of crazies in some ways. Uh, we've had our share of crazies on the left, we still do. Um, and, and you you find people who are willing to storm the best deal, you know, in anything except the most modern movement. Um, but I think it's much better to think of it as the tip of an iceberg. They, that much better to think of it as as in some way representing the feeling of not being heard of many many people, and that's something that we can address. And that's, in fact, it's exactly what Christina addresses in her book, the central question. How can citizens own the, the laws that force them? And you wouldn't have written this, Christina, if you thought they already, already did. <laughs> and, 
So <laughs> that's what we are all addressing. Everyone who's tuned into this uh, to this panel today is, I think, uh, really interested in that question. And it's not just a small group. I mean, my, my own kind of like um, reading of what has happened among the many things that have happened is that we had a kind of technocratic kind of government generating a kind of global economy, a neoliberal global economy behind the backs of the population because the way the global economy was shaped was transnational. It was the decisions made in the 90s with the WTO, the trade agreements, bringing in China into the economy and not in any way, like the, the population did not understand the extent to which those things that were seen as transnational and therefore kind of foreign policy issues, in fact, were going to affect them directly, whether they have a job or not, whether manufacturing jobs exist, whether they went to China. Like now, after 30 years of neoliberal global economy that was created in a technocratic way, completely below the radar of the population, now we see the consequences. And that's what, if that has something to do with what's going on, it can't be just the crazy people who went to the capital. Of course, it's not just the white supremacists. There is a real problem among all of those who have lost the security, who, that are running risks that they didn't even know they had to run. Nobody kind of, kind of consulted with them saying, look, we have this way of doing, going for free trade or not. And I'm sure if there had been consultation, if the people had known what risk they were running, they would have insisted on more security nets, on more precautions for those who will be on the short side of the bargaining, etc. Nothing of that happened. So we went from technocracy, like the elite, the economic elites actually simply implementing the interests of the most powerful. I mean, the WTO is the poster case for that, to Populism, like, oh my God, the problem is globalization, so now let's be nationalist, let's, let's close borders, etc. right? But both are ways of, for us, Democrats clearly re realize that whenever we are stuck between technocracy and populism, we are not going to have a citizenry that kind of willingly runs risks that is, I go back to what Jenny was saying at the beginning, like the problem of coercion of the other side is that you are going to pay for the consequences with your unique life and nobody knows, right, when we try to tackle climate change, who is going to be on the line, whose life is going to be the most impacted. You need to have the population behind saying, you know what, I'm willing to run the risk for my kids and my uh, the next generation, right? I'm going to run that risk, right? But if you do not engage people, if you have only either technocracy or populism, then then it's not going to work. That, that's my reading of why is it really not a matter of like the crazy white supremacists. It, it will not never be the whole population who will go to the capital, right, and do violent things. But what is going on behind, I think, if we look at the last 30 years, it has to do with the whole population and not just like a few. I, I kind of agree with that. Well, well I agree 98%, but um, the 2% the is on your point about consultation. I think uh, that varied dramatically from country to country. So, for example, in Denmark, which has a strong labor movement and a strong set of organizations that are built to be recursive, to actually be consultative, um, the kind, they did an open, you know, they have among the most free trade economy in the world, and yet they have very strong protections for their workers. So that, so, um, and even in the United States, when John F. Kennedy did the first free trade agreement, he made a big speech and said, we're going to have, when you do something that's good for lots of people, but hurts some individuals, you have to compensate. You take from the, you know from the margins of all the good, and you take that money and you help the people out who who, who you're going to hurt. And so they created something called the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act. But it was hugely individualistic, very badly designed, and a complete flop. Um, but it's it, and then of course the labor unions declined. So the, you know the, so the the process of consultation became more and more attenuated. But it's not that there wasn't any and and. and that all, all, all the different countries are equally to blame. So that's my 2% disagreement. Mm -hmm. right. 
Right. I Can I jump back. in yeah. and uh, yeah. maybe move the discussion a bit back also to Christina Lafont's book, yeah, really namely like the question a bit, idea. what's the role of mini publics in all that? I was just thinking, I mean, what about these crazy people, right? I mean, could a mini public have helped, let's say, to, let's say, dampen a bit the kind of crazy spirits? What's your point on that? Because, I mean, Christina's book is not only about mini publics, that would be a, 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 an extreme limitation, but I think it still deals with that in, 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 in big ways and Mark has already talked about the importance of having more such deliberative mini publics. Who wants to start? What's the role of them in a future participatory democracy? I would be happy to start. Please, Mark. Uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in democratic theory, of course, we think about um, the uh, kinds of participants who are involved in various uh, kinds of bodies, and we divide things up into bodies that are elected bodies that are self-selected like open forums or participatory budgeting, and then uh, bodies that are um, organized, uh, randomly selected um, or uh, stratified, um, uh, uh, the result of stratified sampling. Uh, and that of course would be the, the mini public. Uh, the, you all will be able to speak better to this than I will be, but um, self-selected bodies tend to uh, pull out uh, people who are intensely interested, uh, advocates, uh, <laughs> wing nuts, uh, and the like. Uh, many publics uh, draw uh, a much more kind of average, uh, you know, obviously average population, and you get fewer motivated reasoners, uh, you get fewer advocates. Uh, and when people uh, see one another face to face, they often moderate their views. And so there is a, a case for, at least an abstract case, for many publics being able to depolarize um, kind of anger. Uh, I'm not quite sure how many publics scale to get that effect uh, at a, a political system level, um, but it might be possible to think in these terms. Um, the, you know, there's a very interesting experiment going on in Ostbelgian now, where uh, which is. Uh, uh, institutionalizing a, a mini public system. And you could imagine that if uh, issue after issue were treated to many publics, at least in a small enough context like Ost Belgian, that uh, this would produce a lot of um, uh, uh, depolarization. Connecting to what just Mark said, the way of thinking of mini publics, in my view, is as powerful tools that are good for many different things and that we should try to kind of pursue them all at once. For example, having many publics, no matter how many of those, how exactly which questions they are addressing, et cetera, as an institution that gets normalized, as an institution where you can expect that at some level, a lot of citizens will participate, like in the jury, right? People can expect to have participated at some point in their lives in that. So having that, educational effect, for example, by just the, the sheer fact of having many publics as a normal institution, an institution that people are familiar with, like many others, right? That will have all these educational effects for those who participate and also for everyone who doesn't participate to understand why you can not trust that particular institution more than others. What is so special about it? Why is it that you can't trust the fact that those were randomly selected, they have no agenda, they are not already polarized, etc. right? The more even those who do not participate understand what the virtues are of a mini public, why it's so special, why they should trust it, the better it will be for even the communication and what happens politically outside the mini publics. But while we do that, I think that we can also uh, try to get other goodies, other goals that we need for example, a problem, a limitation that I think everybody will agree with many publics so far is that they tend to be top down. And so there is no real agenda setting effect. They already get the agenda set for them, either by academics or by government institutions. And so then in that way, that doesn't allow us, all of us who are not participating or not, like the citizenry in general, to have a better influence on agenda setting. But for example, if we could have something like mini publics that are citizen initiated, right? 
then the, the point of the mini packet will not be only to just address some issues, but to actually give a new channel to bring issues to citizens who are already self-motivated and very engaged on questions, right? But that the mini public could see which ones are more important, more urgent, what the reasons are behind it, right? So we could have mini publics that do a lot of things at once, yeah, right? And not just one goal or another. What I think it will be important is to make them always work towards helping empower the citizenry to make the political system responsive. For example, one case I discuss in my book is that we, we will need more and more anticipatory mini publics. I'm using Mark's term too, namely a lot because of the complexity, a lot of problems we have, we don't even know we have. We, it's hard to know which ones are going to be the most important ones. We don't have the time for all of us to always only react once it has become salient in the public sphere. We may want to have like detectors, mini publics that detect which problems we are running ahead towards and we don't even know how important they are. So we could have kind of anticipatory functions like vigilant functions, of course, putting pressure on the political system by showing that the citizenry with considered opinion really disagrees with what the political system or the parties are saying about things, for example, that puts pressure. And then the other function that I think is important will be um, to help resolve disagreements about among the citizens is what I call contestatory, right? Because there is a danger with mini publics that they are thought of in a technocratic way. There is a problem that is kind of a technical problem. You uh, pull the, uh, a representative sample of the uh, citizenry and then you realize this is the best solution. Some problems are technical, but most problems and the ones that really are um, of most concern are not. They typically will affect the well-being or the fundamental rights and freedoms of citizens. And those political disagreements need to be sorted out among the citizens. You can't just solve it among the few participants. And for that, you could have a mini public that is helping social movements, actors that are already motivated to have a powerful tool, their recommendations of the mini publics as a evidence against a majority, possibly a consolidated majority that has the opposed opinion, to put pressure on them of saying, look, you don't have your, the arguments on your side. We need to review this, for example. Right? In my view, that contestatory aspect is, is typically almost never, uh, it never shows up in the literature on mini publics because it's so much center of what happens within the mini public. But I think that we do have political disagreements. And, and, and if we fool ourselves thinking that all problems are technical, it's not going to work because, like, say, even for climate change, we need to have technical solutions, but we need to convince people that the risks are worth taking, even though they pay the risk in this generation, their life is done and really pay the risk, and maybe the benefits are for the next generation. You can't just do that in a kind of mini public thing, right? You, you, you just need to convince people that that is worth doing, right? And mini publics can help, but the action has to be in the public sphere with the citizenry, right? Can I, just, sorry, yeah. can I ask one little further up question? Because I think you have raised for me a bit of trade-off. In one way, I love the idea of citizen-initiated mini-publics. But on the other hand, you could say random selection is a sort of a top-down process. So if you're damn motivated to actually participate, you cannot because you're not selected. So it's a question to all of you. I mean, and please jump in what Christina said before anyways. Or do you want to react to that? <laughs> You no, see that I, I there, there's already it's developing. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Christina. I, I just want to say yes. No, no, no. I'm very aware. I want it to work that way. So I, I don't think self-selection for social movements, for groups that are motivated to bring something to the political agenda is a problem per se. I think it's crucial, it's great, <laughs> but it does require some kind of filter that is representative of the citizenry as a whole because some self-motivated groups may have political agendas that are not really in tune with or in sync with what the citizenry wants. I, I don't have a rosy view of social movements and groups, right? They can be nice and they can be nasty. So I want to have the randomly selected. It doesn't matter whether it's top down in that way. Organizing, institutionalizing is going to be top down. But that's perfect, no problem. And the citizens are going to not be self-selecting, but they are going to get and look at the proposals coming from society to see which ones to rank them, to explain what the reasons are, etc. Et they can do that for us, for all of us who are not necessarily for each case, 
motivated. Right? So, but that's how I, I'm thinking. And yeah, Super. Jenny was yeah. the same. Yeah, well, the, 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 practice, the practice of um, many publics is rapidly developing, and I think it begins to answer some, some of the innovations are beginning to answer some of the questions that uh, Christina and, and Mark raised. Um, for example, the question of gender setting. Um, Terry Bork wrote a paper a while ago about having a, a multi stage uh, mini publics. And that's, that's happening now in Bogota, something called an um, itinerant citizens assembly where one sets the agenda sort of and then passes the baton on to another randomly selected group, which has a few of the first ones in it, but, but mostly a new group. They go further, they, they suggest some, uh, some, some forms of action. Uh, then the state tries to do that action. And there's a third one that then comes back and monitors um, what the state actually did, and and, and so the, these multi-state assemblies are already being practiced in in Colombia, in Bogota, starting in Bogota. So, um, so the, in in the agenda setting sense, we're beginning to wrap our minds around how to make how to give that agenda setting quality to to the citizens in in practice. On the scaling up. Um, I think there are two uh, ways to go. Uh, one is um, there people are experimenting with all sorts of ways of connecting representatives to um, to the many publics, and that's a very contested I issue because will the representatives, in it, if they're present, will they in any way intimidate the citizens? So far, it doesn't seem to be the case. It, it is an empirical matter. Um, but you want to preserve um, the independence of the citizens. But it, it looks that people are experimenting. So the East German case, uh, East Belgium case that Mark mentioned, is one in which there's quite a direct connection with the parliament. That helps a kind of scaling up in a sense. Is it helps a it helps the um, it helps the mini public have an effect kind of right away. Uh, we, we don't know. Well, we were, everybody's watching East Belgium to see how that works. Um, but it's it. Another way of scaling up is something that I've been pushing forever and ever, and has never happened. Um, I I would love to see many publics use uh, tablets to, to do the pre and post questionnaire, so that you can tell right at the moment of deliberation, after the moment of deliberation, after the event, who's changed uh, her mind or his mind. Then you can you can have a bunch of students with their iPhones go and interview the people who've uh, who've changed their minds and say why, because too many of these many publics, in my view, um, stress just the numbers. There's been this change from X to Y numerically. You know, now there's a majority. Before there was a majority for A, now there's a majority for B, and so we should all pay attention to that, rather than the reasons. And if you had people interviewed about the reasons and broadcast those reasons, um, then I, I think it, would, it wouldn't be a way of taking the mini publics themselves to scale, but it might be a way of taking the reasons to scale. Um, so, um, you know, Kathleen in the audience uh, did a little chat and said, what about people should look at America in one room? Um, and yes, that's a great example of, 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 of previously polarized ordinary citizens moving in their views toward a more, toward more moderate solutions. Um, but it doesn't capture the contestatory feature that 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 I think Christina rightly wants to keep in there. It's not just all kumbaya. Um, it's it, these contests are real and they um, so and I and I think interviewing people about their reasons would, would do that. So that so I think those two questions of agenda setting and scale and all three questions and keeping the context, uh, not just having the goal be, oh, wonderful, somewhere in the middle, you know, um, keeping that context going are, are tremendously important. Super. Mark, maybe a short reaction because I would have a last question for the three of you. Yeah. So um, uh, this just uh, underscores a, a couple of things that uh, Christine and Jenny have mentioned about whether the agendas are being controlled by citizens or by elites. And it's uh, fair to say that most many publics to date have been elite controlled, uh, often on, on uh, fairly technical issues, uh, and they're top down. Uh, the reason that the Ost Belgian uh, 
uh, case is so interesting is that it is uh, one of these examples of a multi-stage process that Jetty is mentioning, where uh, one citizen body, one citizen's body, uh, identifies issues for which uh, ad hoc uh, citizen assemblies can be established and then dissolved. And so there is uh, uh, some citizen control over the agenda there. Uh, another important example is the uh, Oregon uh, Citizens Initiative Review, where um, in, uh, it, this is a response to ballot initiatives which are um, uh, um, generated by um, uh, collecting uh, signatures. Uh, and then uh, the state legislature takes a few of these that are quite important and sends them over to a, a, a small um, deliberative mini public, a citizen's jury, uh, which they hope then uh, will help to guide, to draw attention to the issues, uh, help to educate citizens, uh, perhaps uh, operate as a kind of trusted information proxy. Uh, and then there are, there are cases, uh, Andre will know more about these. There, there are some interesting proposals in Switzerland where you know referendums are, um, <laughs> Uh, very dense, uh, and uh, some suggestions that uh, referen referendums can be improved by running questions through uh, deliberative many publics. Uh, the final thing I want to say is uh, there are many cases where deliberative many publics are a response to advocacy, uh, where the advocacy has become uh, gridlocked or where the advocacy is producing um, uh, really uh, bad representative distortions. Uh, and I could go into a case or two of that. Um, in these cases, uh, a deli deliberative mini public probably needs to be viewed as um, correcting the representative defects of uh, advocacy on the one hand and probably elected representation on the other. Uh, and, and, and this would be uh, uh, a kind of um, uh, plea to view deliberative mini publics uh, not so much as participatory democracy, but as a new. Uh, kind of representative democracy within representative democracies. Super. I would like for the last question I would want to pose to the three of you, I want to go a bit to the question, a more abstract question, namely asking how do we theorize democracy? How do we study democracy in the 21st century? And I think many, and it has also come a bit forward today, would say, well, in some way we have certain models of democracy that we want to promote, like deliberative democracy or direct democracy. Mark has just alluded to that. But there's also another way of thinking through these things. And when we started the whole idea about this event, we were already talking a bit about that, saying we are probably Probably all of us, the four of us, are sort of problem-based thinkers in the sense that we would say we are interested in goals, functions of democracy, and then look back a bit at the practices. My question back to you, and I still know that there are a lot of advocates out there for better democracy, and they're normally model thinkers, because that's the way how you go. You want more direct democracy, you want more deliberation, but maybe a problem-based approach is a much more kind of nuanced and kind of a bit um, distant approach to all that. I would just want to ask you, how, how should we do that? How should we go about this? Maybe Mark could make a little start intro. What was your motivation to think, move away from models? Maybe clarify that and then we step into the discussion. Well, uh, thanks, Andre. Um, a number of years ago, I, I, I found that I uh, stopped teaching uh, models of democracy. And then I had to figure out why I had stopped teaching. And uh, the answer was really pretty simple, which is that uh, Models tend to be built out of um, uh, single techniques, right? Uh, voting elections, for example, or uh, or uh, deliberation, uh, or uh, problems of collective action, and uh, each model kind of adjusts to become more complicated than that. But there seemed to be a kind of theoretical constraint there, and so what I suggested was that we back off of models and ask uh, what a political system need, would need to accomplish if it's going to be democratic. And then I uh, kind of sorted uh, these accomplishments into three very broad categories. It needs to uh, empower inclusions. It needs to uh, formulate those inclusions into collective uh, agendas and wills. Uh, and then it needs to generate the uh, capacity for uh, collective decisions to get things done so that a polity can provide uh, collectively for 
for uh, people. Uh, once you sort these things out, then what you see is that uh, a variety of, of techniques that are uh, kind of associated with democracy, so uh, like voting uh, in elections or deliberating or representing or uh, joining and, and exiting associations, uh, recognizing and so on, uh, that, um, that these are accomplishing should I put it? They have uh, different strengths and weaknesses relative to, to these functions. So, for example, voting is a, a really, really good uh, um, device for uh, equally empowering people. Uh, votes are little pieces of power, but votes are also information poor, right? Uh, people vote in secret. Uh, who knows what they're voting for, and so on. Um, Deliberative mini publics are, are really good for increasing the, uh, the quality of citizen deliberation, uh, but probably not very good participatory devices uh, and so on. And so what this adds up to is a kind of both and, right? If we keep our eye on the kind of uh, normative uh, elements of democracy, then we can ask what all of these techniques are good for, what are they accomplishing within, within a political system, and begin to think about uh, a whole ecology of institutions that uh, where, where there's a kind of broad division of labor uh, across the uh, things that need to be accomplished uh, in a political system to democratize it, uh, and uh, think about uh, how that division of labor ought to look. A uh, final thing I would say is that uh, uh, every uh, system is highly path dependent, right? We only get to start where we are now. And so this means that we need to think about functional equivalence uh, within different systems for achieving uh, democratic goods and goals. And I think this way of thinking helps us to think about uh, uh, functional equivalence rather than being a, uh, you know, a diehard mini public person or a diehard elections person or, or the rest of things. So we need to evolve beyond that if we're going to continue the democratic project. Super. Reactions, Christina, Jenny? I completely agree with what Mark has said. I, I, I love his article. I thought it was really important. And let me maybe instead of kind of reinstating what he has said, which I really believe just as he has said it, let me give an example of why it matters a lot, particularly for deliberative democracy, for deliberative Democrats. I have always found the problem that when people are thinking in terms of models, they are kind of like accepting a kind of mirror view. So the idea is that if you are a deliberative Democrat, that means that you have a view of deliberation or actions that are deliberative as giving you the model for political action in general. I, and that creates, of course, the caricature that critics have of deliberative democracy as wanting to convert politics in a philosophy seminar or even in a mini public. And I think that is so damaging for deliberative democracy, which is the kind of uh, conception of democracy that I really care about. And it is, in my view, is because derivative democracy is really at its core giving you a criterion of legitimacy. It's telling you that only when the political system is responsive to an inclusive and considered public opinion, decisions that emerge out of that feedback loop have democratic legitimacy. But that has nothing to do with telling you what are the appropriate actions to create that kind of virtuous feedback loop, right, that generates democratic legitimacy. But this is not because then deliberation has nothing to say or has no impact. No, it's because you should not have this mirror view about political action. For example, it's obvious that you need, in order to have even a mini public, you need to have some political issue being already salient and worth exchanging formal arguments about it, right? But you cannot generate saliency and political importance and the emotions that come with it by exchanging formal arguments. This is just simply silly. So it's not because it's too utopian, it's because it's a completely category mistake. That has nothing to do with it. No exchange of formal arguments could have had the impact of white people in America on a police brutality that the video of killing George Floyd 
there. There is no, like, but that's not because there is something wrong about formal arguments or philosophy seminars. It's simply because we are talking about many different aspects. And so the, the, the liberative democracy view is not a view about what kinds of actions are the way we want to shape uh, our polity. It's about judging any type of action, any type of political program with the constraint that it has to be compatible with public scrutiny. It has to be able to survive the objections that people will bring to your program, to your political action, and be willing to be sensitive to those objections and to those problems and react accordingly. And so that way you can distinguish political programs that are not democratic because they are not willing to make their program itself dependent on whether they survive public scrutiny and those who are. Right? But then you have all types of actions, all types of models, all types of tools, whether it's voting, of course, deliberating, all kinds of possible political actions, civil disobedience, sit-ins, testimonies, anything that does the different things we need to be done to bring a question to the political deliberation, right? So it does matter. It's not only that it will make you only focus on deliberative actions, it's that then you don't really have a viable view of democracy if you were really thinking all type of political action has to look like an exchange of formal arguments. And still, that doesn't mean that because the other actions are okay, deliberation is just optional. No. If public scrutiny is the core of legitimacy, you are a deliberative democrat, in my view, right? for example. So I think it matters whether you go for goals or for models. I think the mirror idea is, is damaging, and it has damaged a lot for, for deliberative democracy in particular that I kind of care about. <laughs> yeah. Jenny, a last word, and then I would jump into the discussion open for everyone. Jenny. Right. I, I want the discussion, so I'll be I'll be brief. I think all three of us really like Mark. Uh, paper and um, uh, and I've always I never taught models I, 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 I never really paid attention to models I, I never thought they were helpful um, because I see democracy always as a dynamic project a work in progress something that every generation every partial generation is trying to change and make better and use pieces from here and pieces from there and that's the, the, the way I think it ought to be. Um, I just want to pick up one thing when you said, Mark, that the mini publics are not very good on the participatory front. Um, I think that's true at the moment, but let's think about um, Mike ne Neblos and, um, and uh, David Lazar and, and Kevin Esterling's project in which uh, this is in the United States. They've uh, arranged for 175 constituents to get together on the internet for some They've managed to not have this group um, not not proportional to population. They, the, the poor people participate as much as rich people. The only people who over participate are the unemployed and people with children over twelve, under twelve in the home, and that's because they're sitting there with laptops. Um, both both of those groups have a little bit more time with a laptop, but that's not the worst people to set a group to be um, overrepresented. So it's a pretty representative group of 175 constituents getting together with their representative for an hour to discuss just one topic in some depth. Um, now it's not very very deliberative; it's more question and answer, but it could be tweaked to be made more deliberative. My point is that. If every, but what Mike says is, you could just matter of arithmetic, if every member of Congress, every senator and house and person in the House of Representatives um, did this just twice a week, two hours a week, that's all, they could cover a quarter of their constituents in six years. Now, if that were institutionalized, all of us would have had that experience a couple of times. Not only that, our friends would, We'd be talking about it. Kids would be taught in school um, how to, you know, when when you get this, you know, there'd be mock mock back and forth with. It would be part of what it would be to be a citizen. You would expect at least a couple times in your lifetime to have this happen. You expect all your friends to be having it happen to them. So it could be, it could be more participatory. It's not. It's not that the format itself is non-participatory. Um, it, it, it could really change the whole participatory vibe in a country. 
that was a great, great discussion and it will go on. I will open the floor now, but in order to have a kind of an orderly discussion, as we do it in a good mini public, so please put in a hash key in the chat or some sign and then I will call you. So I will prep, maybe you just start and then I will call the first five and then you can just direct your question to Christina, Jenny or Mark. Okay. Or all of them. Let me see. Okay, um, we have um, Emiliano Grossman. You just need to unmute and then speak up. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for this impressive presentation. I must admit, I'm a little, I'm a little at awe with seeing the three of you at the same time because I, I'm a big fan of all of you. I have a question, a little bit more general. So I, I hear that you have talked quite a bit about bottom-up dynamics and the, the three of you trust bottom-up dynamics. Uh, but something that we have learned in, in recent years is that the top-down processes can be very, very harmful, right? So to the extent that the Republican Party has shaped a genera generations of an electorate into a way that makes it hardly compatible with, with the kind of deliberation that you're calling for. So I have a question about two questions. How to, can we ensure that those top-down dynamics become less uh, harmful and more favorable to more deliberative democracy on the one hand. And the other thing, which is because I fundamentally I'm very fond of representative democracy. Uh, originally, uh, parliamentary assemblies were about deliberation, right? So there, this got lost somewhere. Emiliano, so is there a way... If, Emiliano, sorry for interrupting. Can you be short? Everyone should be short, yeah. otherwise we won't... Yeah, yeah, okay. Can, is there a way to re-improve or uh, recreate deliberative practices at the level of central representative constitutions uh, institutions thank you okay who wants i, I think I'll, I'll just take it after one after another please who wants to uh, jump in but also short answer so that we can take as many as we can who wants to answer emiliano just very quickly on that last question i had written down something but i can't read it on the first question um, on that last question, how to ensure that parliaments deliver, or parliamentarians deliberate, I would move back from our pressure on transparency. I would rethink when we want to have the, the public debate and then also provide okay. private spaces for parliamentarians to debate. Uh, Andre's own work has shown that you got much more deliberative creativity in a private chamber than you do in the public chamber where people are just making speeches. I think yeah, I, I would have. Okay, sorry, Mark, please. No, I, I would have referred this question back to Andre because he's uh, done such uh, fabulous work on precisely the question of uh, what types of parliamentary arrangements and electoral systems combine to produce better deliberative uh, bodies, so, uh, which we, we absolutely uh, need. Um, so that's the, the main question. The shaping of the electorate, uh, that's, that's really tough. I mean, going back to the uh, uh, American situation, not to Americanize all of this, but the shaping of the electorate that produced Donald Trump goes back at least to uh, Nixon's Southern strategy, for those of you who know American politics. Uh, the lesson for this is that organizing, grassroots organizing, and then scaling up that organizing is really important, right? It's, it's not necessarily very deliberative, uh, but, um, but the most successful social movements in the U.S. have actually been uh, right-wing social movements over the last 40 years, and that needs to, to change, and I think it is changing. Super. Jenny's going to shake her head on that. It's, it's more complicated. Just quickly, I think the environmental movement has been pretty successful, too. Yeah. Excellent. Then I mean, everyone, oh, sorry, Christina, did you want to? Well, I mean, on the first question, if I understood correctly, it, it had to do with the fact that for any kind of institution that is heavily top down, you will have those type of bad effects. And I think that this is with regard to new institutions like mini publics important that they get shaped in a way that is not top down that we create things like that really give uh the capacity of agenda setting to the citizenry because if they get understood to be top down in that way they won't actually ever have these other effects so that to me that's why it matters now because they are becoming more widespread and more known that we push for 
being able to really not be top down, but have input from the citizenry. Super. I move on to Michael Morel, but just one short question each. Hmm? Thank you very much. And thank you everyone uh, for your presentation. It's great to see everybody. I would like to ask the question of, that doesn't seem to come up very much. And Christina, I think your book's proposal, you know, are very good. And that is the question of how do we maintain legitimacy uh, for the people who lose elections, who lose decisions? How do they feel like they have ownership when they actually go through the whole process and don't get the decision their way? Because I think that's the fundamental thing that's happening at the moment is that we've always had decisions losing, but now the losses seem existential. And that's what's undermining these kinds of legitimacy. So how do we deal with the issue of winning and losing? Christina? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a very complex question and it has many aspects. And, and in the book, I do discuss some of them, but just roughly, it's not a complete answer, but I think that there is an important distinction between losing on issues that you think are still within the realm of what is reasonable and losing on issues that you think are existential, that do actually uh, are a violation of your fundamental rights. To me, that distinction is important in a democracy, is how I understand constitutional democracy. So what we need is to have ways of contestation that can help those who lose on that to reopen the debate, to bring new ways of making clear to a consolidated majority that the issues are too important to just lose because it's, you are not in the majority, in a kind of majoritarian institution. I only talk about the example of a judicial review as a way of contestation, a way to empower citizens to re reopen debates, even if you lose in, uh, in, uh, the, legis in the legislature level, uh, and the construction of human rights courts, even transnational, that are supposed to help us always have a viable way for even a single individual to question the losing in an election or the losing on decisions that they themselves still don't see as reasonable, whether they are right or wrong. And that what we need is to have more of that. And I think many other type of institutions, even many publics, could help to have this ability for citizens on the losing side to make their case again and again, and not having the impression that if you lose the election, that's it. If, if you are in the minority, that's it, and that has legitimacy. I, I, I don't think that a, majority, a purely majoritarian view of legitimacy is, is feasible, and then we also see the backlash that we are seeing. Right, and we all maybe noticed that someone in the chat just pointed out that the two of the two parties first past the post system is particularly polarizing. In a, in a multi-party system, you might hope if, even if you lost, your the coalition that of, of many parties that's governing, you might be able to get X, Y, and Z in here. You might be able to do this and that and the other thing. So it's the, the polarization is particularly uh, bad in a two-party system with first past the post uh, structure. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. And one thing that, is, um, that keeps Democrats up at night are uh, systems that <clears throat> uh, load issues that can be negotiated onto identities <clears throat> that are difficult to negotiate. Um, and here there's quite a bit of, um, you know, the, the two extremes are, as Jenny's mentioning, the, the first past the post system, which loads onto adversarial, adversarial relationships and then loads those relationships onto identities. And it makes it very difficult for losers to accept uh, uh, results. Uh, many publics, is, these are the, the, the contrasting opposite, right? Uh, people get into a room, they appreciate whether people, what, where other people are coming from. And the identity polarization tends to break down uh, in favor of uh, issue negotiation. Um, so it's probably not very helpful to the uh, the broad problem, but okay, we have and this is actually something that uh, that uh, Michael Morrell should be addressing since he is uh, uh, the expert in uh, democracy and political psychology. Super. We have a next question from Joanna. Thank you. Hello. Um, a lot of what's been discussed has been the role of deliberative processes 
kind of as a gender setting or capturing or shifting public opinion. Um, but part of deliberation and deliberative processes is also about creating meaningful policy change. So I guess I'm wondering how do you balance the kind of bottom up agenda setting uh, and self ownership alongside the policy priorities of leaders? Um, or how do you actually create kind of meaningful policy change? Who wants to react? I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Sorry, I think it's essentially, is there a trade-off between capturing public opinion and doing bottom-up deliberative processes with um, leading to recommendations that actually have an opportunity to create policy change? Mm. Uh, Mark, please go. Yeah, so uh, in the, the mini public world, um, again, the majority of mini publics are um, kind of driven by policy problems and tend to be linked into the policy process. Uh, so, uh, but often, uh, again, these are uh, relatively, relatively narrow, often very technocratic issues, uh, though they don't have to be. Uh, but the advantage is that uh, many publics um, uh, respond very, very closely to kind of um, mostly bureaucratic uh, policy agendas. The bottom up parts are uh, much more important for things that citizens are prioritizing. Uh, and it's often when elites uh, are uh, worried that they are not um, uh, picking up uh, kind of the rational grassroots that they will um, uh, accept or respond to um, uh, grassroots driven uh, many public uh, types of models. Uh, I don't know that I have much more intelligent things to say than that. Good. I think I, I, I must to admit I lose a bit track in the chat so I may not be able to include everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I posted a, a question. Sorry about jumping the gun. But um, I think this has been fascinating, and I've been looking at this uh, at the general issue of of, of condition changing conditions in society through government, and uh, the how the how the what was pretty easy, I have to say, even though the book isn't published yet. But the how is not, and two parts of that were were this uh, the citizen engagement. I think that's a one of the two solutions to every part of the model, and the other piece was measuring outcomes or being more outcome focused and measuring those outcomes. I wondered if there's any intersection between these two areas of study uh, from the work that you've all experienced, uh, experienced as you work on deliberation. I, I think the only thing that I want to say about that is that um, measuring, so citizen engagement is, um, uh, of course, uh, um, you know, we, we model that now through this uh, uh, increasingly dense uh, democratic innovations uh, literature uh, with lots of different styles and models. Uh, on the, and, and I would uh, send people to Participedia, by the way, if you want kind of a, a participation deliberation zoo to see, get a, get a sample of what is out there. Um, measured outcomes for these things is really difficult. And uh, others can maybe jump into this. Uh, I agree it would be really nice to be able to measure outcomes, but um, but they're really hard to track. Uh, we, we do have kind of some ethnographies where, uh, you know, a particular um, uh, citizen engagement device produces, produced recommendations that kind of fed through into policy or fed through into greater legitimacy. Uh, but it, but it's really hard to measure. This isn't uh, something I do. Uh, Andre is the, the, uh, one of the more empirical among us, and maybe he can comment on that. Yeah, but I think it's a really hard question. I think Mike Neblo has done a wonderful study by looking how such many public interactions translate into networks, in our personal networks. And the way that you say, okay, I've been part and participant in a mini public, and now I'm telling my friends, my family about what has happened. And this is all things that are very hard to track because you could say this is a very big scaling up question or an issue because people actually learn and you say, oh, 
you have been part of a mini public, very interesting. So we don't know how much the kind of diffusion of all these events actually goes. Like the rioters, I mean, they might have, they also have their network. So they spread their messages, even if these are awful messages, perhaps, but they do it. But we are not so good at tracking networks. We can always do good network studies, but on a, on a specific event, that's really, really difficult. But I think that's the way we should go as well. In a, about a year and a half, uh, there will be a book called Assessing Deliberative Democracy, um, in which uh, Andre has a chapter and a bunch of other people have a chapter that I've agreed to write the concluding chapter. And almost all the chapters are written. I mentioned the book will come out in about, um, I haven't read any of them yet myself, but I mentioned the book will come out in about a year and a half. And I think then it will bring together uh, everyone on the cutting edge of this question of assessing deliberative democracy. Excellent. Let me go on. I again, I'm, I'm just apologize if I don't. I'm not able to see everyone. I thought I had Gisela on the list, and then I have David Morrison who put a question into the chat, and then I have Victor. Gisela, please. Thank you. Um, my question is with respect to how to build momentum for bottom-up deliberative processes in the presence of resistance from the politicians who, in the end, would have to give the stamp of approval to these recommendations from these processes and uh, I'm going on the assumption that no one here would be supporting the idea of a referendum on electoral reform for you know for very obvious process reasons so just a question on how to build momentum for citizen-based processes in the presence of resistance from people who might be out of a job if some of those recommendations were adopted how do we overcome that thank you I, I would like to jump in uh, just to elaborate on something I mentioned in passing in, the book, in my book, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting in the case of this type of institution. So the question of how do you get power out of nowhere is always hard, right? Why will people who have power kind of give it voluntarily to those who don't? And in this case, we are trying as citizens to have more power than we already have. And why will those who have it, namely the politicians in particular, give it to us? Okay, so that's a, a, a problem always whenever you have a political struggles. But what I find particularly interesting in the case of many publics is that you cannot um, think of institutions uh, as always kind of favoring your side or the other side, right? So you go for an institution and then you figure out what happens. So. One reason why politicians could go into further institutionalizing mini publics is because it will give them legitimacy in the obvious kind of environment we are now where citizens are reclaiming it, etc. Why will they buy into it? Because mini publics is an institution where you cannot second guess who is going to win when. So I will have my hopes on the institutionalization for other questions that are not necessarily electoral reform or like those that really create a self-interested problem for politicians. The problem is there is, in my view, a kind of canning of institutions. You first create them, you think they'll be good to you because they bring legitimacy, because you don't know whose side in a political debate is going to win. And once you have institutionalized, they have a kind of logic that makes it much harder then to say, oh, no, but uh, not electoral reform, please. Nothing, not the salaries of politicians, right? So I wouldn't hope that it will start there precisely. I think it could start with other questions about environmental challenges, etc. And those who have the power will be motivated because it's not the kind of institution that clearly is going to favor one political side over another. That's why I see that there is some kind of hope. Uh, if it were otherwise, it would be probably just a, a pipe dream. Uh, but I do put hope on that kind of cunning that could come from the fact that once it's institutionalized, it becomes harder and harder to remove questions from it. Yes, exactly. Um, the, Christine, Chris, you used the word uh, uh, um, build momentum, and Christina uses the word institutionalized. And I think that's exactly how this is going to happen. It's going to happen drop by drop. It's going to happen by building it up. And why would the politicians go along with it? in the beginning, because it, sometimes it solves a lot of problems for them. I think of the uh, decision in Rome that Jim Fishkin um, mentions, where they had to reduce hospital beds, 
and not a single elected representative wanted to have hospital beds reduced in their district because they'd get blamed. So a citizens assembly or, you know, deliberative poll comes together, comes up with principles on how to, how to reduce the number of hospital beds. And then the politicians can say, it's not me, you know, the, the citizens did it. So there's a lot of, a lot of ways in which this can help elected representatives. Ironically, we started with uh, British Columbia and Ontario with an issue electoral reform, which really was problematic for the politicians. And many of the politicians very, very much opposed those assemblies. But you don't have to start with those ones. If you're thinking incrementally and you want to build it up as you, in other words, get momentum for it, start with the ones where it helps the politicians. Can I jump in on this as well? Um, so uh, I, I don't disagree with anything anybody said, <clears throat> but it does open up a whole uh, area of research that we have not very been very good at developing. Um, <clears throat> one of the ways to think about this is the way that Jetty is thinking about it, which is that there are, are kinds of issues that produce incentives for politicians to go to uh, good processes. Uh, but for the most part, politicians, when they think of the people, engaging the people, they think of referendums and they think of town halls, and there's nothing uh, in their imagination in between. And they usually hate both of those because they have a difficult time uh, controlling them. Uh, and they, they, they literally don't trust the people, right? So we usually think of uh, trust problems as people trusting elites. If you flip that around, we uh, need to ask, what would it take for, say, representative, uh, uh, elected representatives to trust the people? It's probably these uh, better processes, right? Not, not town halls, for example, but more like deliberative mini publics. So how do you get there? Uh, one uh, very interesting case, set of cases, is the, the Irish Citizens Assembly cases, where uh, a strategic decision was made to include a limited number of politicians in a Citizens Assembly. And the result was that uh, the politicians were impressed. They didn't know that they would be impressed, but they were impressed once they saw people uh, learn and pay attention and, and uh, discuss things reasonably and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, there is a lot of suspicion in the many public world uh, about including elites in uh, these processes. Uh, but if it's done uh, carefully, and with the aim of bringing politicians on side for something that they have to be involved in to move a mini public set of recommendations into law or policy, then it's something that we need to think about. Okay, I think we are running a bit out of time, so I'm just being totally <laughs> selective and I pick one question, which I think is a good one maybe to end from Rachel Walsh and she writes, I wanted to ask about the panel's views on attitudinal representativeness coming from the Irish experience. This is emerging as an issue of concern, re-legitimacy as we develop our deliberative democracy practice. What's your reaction to that? Christina, Jenny, Mark. And and I can just expand. Question. Sorry, I can just say, I can just, Please Rachel do. here, I can expand on the question a little bit if, if that's helpful. Uh, I suppose I was involved with the assembly um, and I'm a lawyer, not a political scientist for context, but uh, one emerging piece of evidence from the assembly has been that it was predisposed in terms of attitudes to liberalization on you know the high profile issue of abortion uh -huh. and i suppose we're moving on now to thinking about using mini publics to look at very controversial issues like reunification on the islands on the island of ireland etc so what we've been trying to do work on is is considering whether there is a legitimacy concern uh, where we are not confident in the attitudinal representativeness of the makeup of a mini public. Um, so I just wanted to get your views uh, and expertise in terms of how much we should be worried about that or not. Thanks very much. I think we should be worried about it quite a bit. Um, and I, I don't know quite how that happened. Uh, a random, uh, appropriately drawn random sample ought to be attitudinal as well. I think of the Citizens Assembly on Brexit that uh, was held in Britain, and they did use attitude 
precisely attitude, and they made sure that the attitudes were proportional to the population uh, going in. I think that that's a good thing to do. I mean, I was going to mention um, Fiskin's model. I mean, the derivative pole model is one in which it's very important to make sure that the initial uh, representative sample does mirror the opinion that the public has. And so in that case, you do need to control for not having a, a different kind of view to begin with than what the population has. That, but that should not be too hard to, to manage. I think the derivative polling does that. Um, yeah, I would just add to that that um, uh, often many publics are constructed around um, common demographic variables. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to uh, uh, include attitudes and ad attitudinal uh, sorts of things. Uh, but uh, John Grisek, Simon Niemeyer, and his group in uh, Canberra have uh, put a fair amount of attention to um, uh, using uh, uh, methods like Q sorts to see if they can kind of get at the deep. Uh, representation of, of value frames in uh, the way the bodies are constructed, but it, but I think it's still fairly unusual and uh, and a little bit difficult to do. I have a very last thing to the three of you. I do remember Jenny was there as well two and a half years ago. We had a fantastic workshop on the Oxford Handbook with Jürgen Habermas in Stuttgart. And I still remember what he said, what he wanted to say as the last thing. So he said, what is the most important thing in for democracy? And he said, the force of the better argument. What about you? What would you say? What's the most important thing for democracy in the 21st century? Wow, so that one is taken already? <laughs> That's unfair. Uh, because I do think that in the end, the problem that we are heading towards with the social media is going to be how to access information through things we thought we could have in the past and that were not sufficient, now are no longer even available. So I do think that having information and being able to exchange it and let the unforced force of the red argument work is one of the main challenges, unfortunately. Super. Jenny, if you have... I, I think that, that, of course, the force of the better argument is extremely important, but I want to come back to Christina's main point. The owner the ownership of the citizens by the law, of the, their own ownership of the laws, their sense of identification, these are our laws. Even if you're in a minority, being a, having a system that's legitimate enough uh, to carry you through being in that minority for a, a period of time. So um, I would come back to ownership of the law. Super. Mark? Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add to that. I think that uh, the way Jenny puts it is that absolutely essential. That kind of feeds through all of the little pieces of democracy that, um, that we worry about. Uh, and just to emphasize, uh, you know, what Christina is saying, uh, uh, we de deliberative Democrats uh, are not uh, able yet to think about the new social media environment in ways that are uh, helpful and productive. Uh, there may be some thoughts out there. Uh, I haven't found them. So this is the, the most profoundly disturbing thing from the standpoint of uh, the force of the better argument. <laughs> Yes, wonderful. I can only thank you for a wonderful conversation, for fantastic questions. And as I said before, it's all recorded. We'll put it online on several channels so that if you haven't got everything or were interrupted, you can still listen back to it. Thank you so much, Christina, Jenny and Mark. And I think it's a big applause for the three of you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for bringing us together, Andre. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you uh, for organizing. Thank you, Christina, for the wonderful book. Uh, uh, thank you, all of you, for engaging with it and for organizing this. Absolutely great.